Hello and welcome to NASCAR News Now. We're going to get you caught up on all the newsworthy highlights since Daytona. We've also got all the action that took place right here in Indiana, as well as throughout the first round of the playoffs. I'm Blake Harms. And I'm Nick Rakowski. Thanks for joining us. And what a season it has been. From Joe Gibbs' dominance to Matt Benedetto's breakout performances to fistfights and everything in between, NASCAR has seen its fair share of action thus far. And there's still seven races to go. But before we dive into what's coming in the playoffs, let's begin with a quick season recap to get you up to speed. Tempers have flared several times throughout the year and has involved some unlikely drivers. The first took place at ISM Raceway in Phoenix back in March, when Daniel Suarez wasn't pleased with a move Michael McDowell made. This, this was during group qualifying, which had his fair share of troubles early on in the year. Yeah, so much so that the process of group qualifying was officially dumped after an incident at Auto Club Speedway in March, in which all 12 cars in the final round of qualifying failed to cross the start-finish line before time expired. In the days after, NASCAR made the decision to go back to single-car runs. Meanwhile, the other tussle that made headlines this season occurred during a non-points race, oddly enough. But with a million dollars on the line, it's easy to see how drivers could have some issues with each other. The trouble between Clint Boyer and Ryan Newman began with several on-track incidents throughout the All-Star race in May. After the end of the race, Clint Boyer began wailing on an unhelmeted Ryan Newman who was still in his car. The two drivers had very different perspectives on what transpired. Well, uh, 14 shot me on the front straightaway earlier in the race. I just about turned him around. If I went into brakes, I would have turned, turned him around. And then after the race, I just went up and tapped him in the back, let him know I didn't appreciate the way he raced me. And then he body slammed me. And then I hit him back a little bit on the back straightaway, and then he just cut across my nose in, in uh, turn three. So it um, doesn't take much of a man to try to fight somebody with a helmet on. Uh, I think he should be embarrassed of himself. But uh, we'll enjoy a nice cold Coke and try to figure out what we can learn from today. We uh, didn't uh, do very well with our eight corners forward. Thanks, Ryan. Matt? And that was the version from Ryan Newman. So what's your take, Clint, of, of what happened on this prize fight here on Pit Road? Yeah, it's a, it was a damn sure surprise <laughs> fight. I don't know what the hell his beef was. They, uh, I thought he was a lap down. You know, we were, our day was over. We, we lost track position there, got sideways, crossed up, and basically, you know, just, just buying time there and uh, seeing if something's going to happen at the end. They got four wide off of four. Hell, I thought he was a lap down. I checked up, and he run to my left rear, and, that's the last I saw of him. And then after the race, he comes and runs into my back and turns me all around. And I pull up next to him, and he dumps me in the floor. Where I come from, you get poked in the nose for that. That's what he got. So, Nick, you saw that video. You're someone who just got back in the sport. It seems like the old days when some of these guys are finally showing some passion, willing to fight with each other, and even during a non-points race. Oh, yeah, definitely. A oh, million dollars can really do that to you. Like million dollars I want some myself and I'd always watch those YouTube videos of the olden days where they just go at it yeah and it's no rules no yeah. really regulations well yeah you you look at Tony Stewart Bristol 2012 throws oh, yeah. the helmet at Matt Kenseth and and you have Newman and Boyer perhaps two of the most you know hard helmeted no pun intended drivers <laughs> in the series going at it um, they're both gonna speak their minds and Boyer had something to do about it oh yeah definitely he thought Newman was uh lap down but turns out he wasn't and Newman wanted to win that money too so. yeah and what does Newman do after the interview drinks a nice ice cold coke oh yeah gotta support those sponsors <laughs> well meanwhile this season has sure featured some big underdog moments the biggest upset of the season came during the rain delayed coke zero sugar 400 at Daytona in July after rain pushed the Saturday night race to Sunday afternoon chaos ensued on stage three when Austin Dillon turned in front of the field before they were able to restart, lightning moved into the area and put the race under a red flag. Heavy rain developed not long after, all while 19-year-old Xfinity Series driver Justin Haley was scored in the first position. The race was called, and in his just his third start in the NASCAR Cup Series, Haley was declared the winner. While Haley's win was a shock, perhaps no one has gained more fans this season than Matt DiBenedetto. Less than a week after it was announced he wouldn't be returning to the Levine Family Racing 95 car, he came 12 laps from winning the NRA night race at Bristol. Listen to the cheers from the crowd as he appears on the Jumbotron. It's the heartbreak story of the evening, the guy that the crowd went wild for when you took the lead, Matt DiBenedetto. I think that says it all right there, you guys. You can hear the crowd right now roaring for him. I think you had everyone here on your side. You had everyone on social media on your side. What are the emotions with such a close run there in light of everything's news? That's up. Uh... Lots of emotion for this driver. That's the support that a driver like this needs right now, you guys. 
After this race, Barstools came on as a sponsor for several races during the playoffs. It was announced earlier this month that De Benedetto would be replacing the retiring P Paul Menard in the number 21 Wood Brothers car for the next season. What a month it has been for De Benedetto. Yeah, and I know you've turned into a big fan. Oh, I'm a huge and fan of Benedetto. And it's been a huge month for him. In fact, I just bought, what, three shirts off of Barstool Sports yeah. because... Well, I, that, I that's a, just one of many powerful partnerships he's been able to build. Oh, yeah. You know, last season he was in that 32 car, said, I deserve better, made the jump without having a team lined up, you know, got Levine family racing. Now it was announced he was going to be forced out of the 95 to make room for Bell, which we'll get into in a bit. And what does he do? He turns it into an even bigger opportunity to get with Wood Brothers. And he's really proved himself this season, not just Bristol, but even just road courses. I think it was 4th, 6th, yeah. and now 11th at the Roval, which we'll get into later as well. And he's just been proving himself all time. At what? He was leading, he led the most laps at Daytona too, right? Yeah, yeah, yep, he did. So. And you look at how much he's transformed that team over this past year. Um, you know, imagine what he's going to do with Wood Brothers now having a team Penske on. Oh, yeah, and he brought it up for Christopher Bell, too. We'll talk about that as well. Yeah. Because he's really changed how Joe Gibbs helps out the 95. Right. Well, and this season even, isn't even done yet. I mean, he's kind of been a force at super speedways. We have Talladega coming up in this next round. Oh, yeah. I, I think he really wants to get a win for this team, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's able to get one. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Talladega is the race that he does it. We'll have to see how he qualifies and yeah. how the race persists because you always know the yeah. big one does happen at Talladega. It does, or multiple. Yeah, yeah, or multiple. Well, unfortunately, Matt Benedetto wasn't the only one who made headlines that weekend. On the Thursday before the race, while trying to land at the airport, the junior motorsports plane carrying Dale Earnhardt Jr. and his family crashed past the runway and caught fire on a highway. The images that came from that wreck were scary, to say the least. Miraculously, no one was seriously injured, including their dog, and Dale returned to the NBC booth after taking the weekend off to rest at home with his family. On the Fox side of broadcasting, Darrell Waltrip concluded his 19th season of broadcasting by announcing his retirement. Several drivers ran Waltrip-related paint schemes during his final broadcast at Sonoma. It has not been announced who, if anyone, will be replacing him alongside Mike Joy and Jeff Gordon next season. Well, the overarching big storyline this season has been the year of Joe Gibbs racing. And the four Toyota drivers have combined to win 15 of the 29 races that's been run this season, including the Daytona 500. Martin Truex Jr. leads the way with six wins. Kyle Busch and Denny Hamlin both have four, and Eric Jones has one. Nick, it seems like no matter what race they're in, there's always one of those four drivers, if not more, that's running up at the front. Exactly. We were talking about Rich, and even though Eric Jones did get disqualified, they were the top four. Yeah. You always see Truex has been dominant so far in the playoffs. Kyle Busch eh, hasn't really been. But he was dominant early in the season. Denny Hamlin wins here and there with four. They're just, it's a dominant team, and yeah. I don't know who can even top them. Yeah, I mean, you look at... You know, if Jones hadn't been knocked out of the playoffs this past round, it's easy to see how three of those Joe Gibbs drivers could be in the championship four. Oh, exactly. Right? I would even think if Jones didn't get disqualified, his momentum continues because yeah. he was a fourth-place finish, maybe gets a couple more points, and he could be up in, like, the top six right now in the playoffs. Absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, the next round unfolds for sure. Well, one other headline that seems to be constantly evolving in the world of NASCAR is silly season, and this year has certainly been no different. There's been several major driver changes announced for the 2020 season so far. Here's what we know so far. Yeah, so we start with the number eight car, Richard Childress Racing, right? Uh, Hemrick is booted out of that car after only one year. Which is surprising because he's a rookie this year. You maybe want to give him a little bit more time. Yeah, they've been struggling big time the past few years. So Tyler Reddick, who runs their Xfinity program, will be stepping in that car. You think that's a good move for Richard Childress? Tyler Reddick has really proved himself this year. I think, what, it's four or five wins in the Xfinity Series? Yeah. And he's running in the playoffs right now in the Xfinity Series. He's, I think he's perfect for him. So Yeah, I agree. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where Hemrick ends up. But as we go down the list, you'll see he may have a few options. Yeah. Next one is Ricky Stenhouse, booted out of the 17 Roush Fenway car. Uh, Chris Buescher will be replacing him. Now, that came as a surprise last week. That really came as a surprise. I mean, Stenhouse hasn't really proved himself. He... It's known to wreck people, yeah. as he did a couple times. But Stenhouse will find a ride this year, I will say that. Yeah. If, even if he switches with Chris Buescher. But I think Chris Buescher is a great racer, and he has a lot of potential with the 17. Car. Yeah, and this is one of the several announcements they managed to keep under wraps quite a bit. Oh, uh, yes. I know Buescher was in the process of signing with his uh, 37 team when the option came open for him to, to join um, Roush Fenway. So that was certainly a big surprise. Stenhouse has been struggling with that a bit. He has two wins. They were both in 2017, though, so... Uh, be interesting to see where he ends up. Yeah. And then there's the biggest story that I like to think of. Menard retiring, but De Benedetto, after he gets kicked out of the 95 yeah. car, 
has a probably, I would say, a much better team to work with with the Wood Brothers in the 21 car. Yeah, a Team Penske affiliate. And I would argue this was the biggest surprise to me. Yeah, Paul Menard, he's been re running relatively well this year. Yeah. I didn't think he was of age, maybe, and just... Yeah. I guess he just wanted to retire. Yeah, want, wanted to, yeah, kind of settle down a bit. And the thing is, I mean, there were rumors starting to fly around that DeBandetto may even be going to Xfinity, Joe Gibbs Xfinity. You know, they were talking about that. Um, maybe we're filling David Reagan's seat as he's retiring. Um, so he was kind of in a weird situation. I think he pulled a power move there, announcing with Wood Brothers. I, don't, oh, I yeah. think that was far exceeded almost anyone's expectations. Yeah, and he's going to have a lot of sponsors with that. Hopefully Barcelona stays with him with that because yeah. it's bringing more money for him and yeah. keep that Wood Brothers racing just going strong. Yeah, well, and speaking of which, the thing that sent him out the door was Christopher Bell coming in that 95 car. Uh, Joe Gibbs will be increasing that alliance with the 95. That's going to be a team that I think could pretty easily probably make the playoffs next year. Would yeah, it, I would almost consider that a fifth Joe Gibbs racing car because you have pretty much Joe Gibbs backing it 100%. You yeah. know Christopher Bell is going to just run away yeah. with that 95 car. Yeah, mop the floor with it. I think he has a seven wins on the year already. Oh, my gosh. In the yeah, that's way too much for the Xfinity Series, and he's going to bring a lot to the table in the Cup Series. Yeah, well, and there are a few rides that are still empty, uh, just recently became open. David Reagan retiring from that 38 car. And Chris, with Chris Buescher leaving the 37 car, that leaves a few open seats. And there's there have been a few candidates floating around, but no clear front runners right now. I think Stenhouse is going to end up in one of those cars, either the 38 or the 37. I just don't know which one because yeah, kind of who's going to yeah, who's going to pick him up? It'll be a question. But I think he is going to stay in the Cup Series. It's, it's in between the 37 and 38, though. Yeah, and I think we've kind of talked about this before. I think the silly season next year is going to be awfully intense. Um, in terms of several big drivers who may be retiring, I think you can't leave out Kurt Busch, Jimmy Johnson, Clint Boyer. I think those are all options. One other thing we haven't talked about for this year, does Cole Custer take anyone's seat? I'm not sure Cole Custer does just quite yet. Yeah. There's a possibility. I just think there's too many drivers that already have solidified positions that yeah. came up from the Xfinity Series now, which is uh, Tyler Reck and Chris Rebell. And then you do have two open seats, but one of those is going to be taken by Stenhouse. Maybe you bring up Cole Custer or... We'll see. If, for some reason, he were to get into Stuart Haas, move from the Stuart Haas Xfinity to the Stuart Haas Cup team, which driver, if you're any of the Stuart Haas drivers, which one would you be most concerned with? Uh, Suarez. Yeah. Suarez, he started off this year decently well, but he just didn't perform at the end of the year. He kind of performed a little bit in the beginning of the playoffs, even though he was a non-playoff driver. He kind of saw him up there in the top ten a little bit. But, yeah, he just not had a good year this year. Yeah, I think I think I certainly agree. Suarez has got to be concerned. If not this year, then next, um, unless he can step it up. And we've seen drivers perform under pressure, like Eric Jones. You know, there was a brief period where they were wondering if Bell would replace him, yeah. and he went out and won at Darlington. So. Yeah. Well, now that we've gotten you caught up on the 2019 headlines across NASCAR, let's recap what occurred in the past month. We begin with the final race of the regular season right here at Indiana. It was the Brickyard 400 at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Kevin Harvick led the field to green alongside Paul Menard. Early trouble for playoff hopeful Daniel Suarez as he brushed the wall. During the caution, chaos on pit road involving several drivers. You see Landon Castle with a vicious hit. And more mayhem as Eric Jones and Brad Keselowski both sustain hard hits coming out of turn two on a restart. Brad's car there up along the tire barrier. Fortunately, he climbs out of the car under his own power. Joey Logano would win stage one under caution. Trouble for Kyle Busch as his engine expires in turn three. It would catch fire on pit road, bring out another caution. Kevin Harvick would go on to win stage two. More mayhem later on with a big wreck as Jimmy Johnson collects Kurt Busch, Menard, and others. A bad break for then leader Ryan Blaney as you see Kyle Larson getting into the wall, throwing off pit strategy. Yet another wreck coming out of turn two as Bowman slides across the track. This one fortunately a one-car incident. Matt Tift also with problems and another caution. Hard contact there. Newman held off Suarez for the final playoff spot, and Kevin Harvick would go on to win his second Brickyard by a large margin after a late race restart. He led 118 of the 150 laps on the day. What a performance. The playoffs kicked off the following Sunday at Las Vegas Motor Speedway with temperatures soaring into the 100s. Stuart Haas Racing led the field to green with Suarez gaining the early advantage as the field fanned out behind them. Kyle Busch had trouble early, making hard contact with the wall after sliding up the track. Joey Logano took home the Stage 1 win. Watch these tight racing quarters between Blaney, Truex, and Nemechek. Martin Truex Jr. would use lap traffic to his advantage to get around Logano for the Stage 2 win. 
Chaos ensued to begin the third stage as Wagano and Truex battled for the lead. The restarts became even more intense with four wide racing across the track. It became a three wide battle for the lead as Chase would briefly get ahead of Truex, but it wasn't long before William Byron spun and brought out the caution after losing a rear tire. The next restart proved to be even more intense as Blaney and Hamlin fought hard for the lead. Kurt Busch quickly developed a tire rub after contact. Meanwhile, Hamlin ran Blaney up the track and allowed Harvick to, Harvick to grab the lead. Kurt Busch's tire blew before long, bringing out another caution after that hard contact with the wall. Joey Logano wasn't holding back, forcing it four wide and damaging his nose in the process. It came down to Martin Truex Jr. and Kevin Harvick as the laps winded down, but it was clear that Truex had the faster car and he was able to sail by Harvick with less than 20 laps to go. He was able to grow his lead considerably in that short time and made a bold statement by winning the opening race of the playoffs. What a win by that team. Yeah, it truly was. We also want to play the post-race interview from Kyle Busch that made headlines. Take a listen. What happened there with the 53 uh, there late? 52, get it right. Don't know. Right. How did that impact your car? Killed it. What did you think? Were you happy that you were able to come back after the early damage? Nope. Here? Or what happened there at the beginning of the race? I'm just here so I don't get fined. Here. How about the heat? The, what effect? It's all great. Go fine out there the whole time? Any songs that you go into a place where you won last time, last year, originally? Nope, can't pass there. You feel okay about your chances overall? Still, don't care. Does it help you at all that you got the bonus points coming in here? Race. Just here so I don't get fined. You feel like if, if you had been able to get in the top 10, would you? I'm answering the dumbest questions over and over again. Am I good? Yeah, typical Kyle Bush there. Yeah, yeah, you can't expect more out of him other no. than that. Kind of, you know, mad about what happened, but if you look at it, it's. Yeah, it's really his fault. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, yeah, I would agree with that. The thing is, you know, every time he doesn't have a good day, he could come in second, and he did at Richmond, as we get into here yes. in a bit. He's not happy, and he hates being beat by his teammates. Oh, he definitely does. He especially if Truex is winning, because Truex is his biggest contender right now in the playoffs. So yeah, and he did not doesn't have a lot of momentum right now. And after that race, especially, you even hear him asking if he's done with the with the interviews because the questions were uh, expletive stupid, you know. Yeah. But it's also Kyle Busch, his personality brings a lot in the sport that I don't think people appreciate it. It really does because Kyle Busch kind of like, he's different. He's really much different because he, he has this tone that he wants to win. Yes. You don't really see that. You see that in drivers, but they kind of like are more explosive with their emotions towards wanting to win. And Kyle yeah. Busch kind of just lays back and yeah. bland. If he doesn't win, mad, wins. Okay, I won. Yeah, just yeah. That's exactly we'll it. We'll see if he uh, can pull those winning numbers in the playoffs yeah. this year. So. Well, and the interesting thing, too, is there are a lot of Kyle Busch haters, obviously. And they seem, obviously, to hate when he wins a race. Yeah. But they also seem to be upset when he doesn't win a race and gets upset about it. So Kyle Busch is usually in a lose clue situation anyway. Yeah, he really is. I, I'm not a huge Kyle Busch fan myself. I can respect his winning style and yeah. how he races. He's a great racer. But, yeah, it's he doesn't re really respect the... Uh, news reporters yeah. and everything, so... Yeah, gets caught up in the moment a little bit. Oh, he always does, yes. Yeah. The action continued the following Saturday night at Richmond Raceway in Virginia. Brad Kozlowski led the field to green. There was lots of contact early as David Reagan slid up into William Byron. Meanwhile, it became a battle at the front between Kozlowski and Truex as they maneuvered around Bubba Wallace. Truex was able to cruise to the Stage 1 victory. Alex Bowman slid up into Austin Dillon on the opening lap of the second stage, and Dillon returned the favor in the next corner by putting the bumper to the back of the 88, sending him around and bringing out a caution. Kyle Busch held the lead in time to claim a stage two win with Truex close in tow. Joe Gibbs Racing restarted 1-2-3 in stage three with Busch grabbing the early advantage. Ryan Newman and Eric Jones raced each other hard all night long with an undoubtedly impressive performance by that six car. Another caution there from Reed Sorensen. Kozlowski led the restart, but didn't take long for Truex to slide around the two car on the outside. But trouble struck shortly thereafter as he was spun around by the 17 car of Ricky Stenhouse Jr., fortunately avoiding any contact with the wall. 
The replay shows Stenhouse with fresher tires sliding up the track and getting into the 19. But that didn't slow Truex down as another wild restart unfolded there. Bush with the early advantage, but Truex used lap cars as a pick once again to get below Bush and take back the lead. They battled hard for a few laps, even making some contact, but Truex had the dominant car as he went on to win the second straight race of the playoffs and yet another impressive performance by the 19 car in Joe Gibbs Racing. Now, it was set to be Joe Gibbs Racing's first ever, first, second, third, fourth finish, but Eric Jones' car failed post-race inspection and the results were disallowed. Still, a race team cannot ask for much more than what Joe Gibbs earned to kick off the playoffs. No, they really can't. Joe Gibbs dominated the first half of the playoffs and we're yeah. interested to see what Joe Gibbs is going to do for the rest. Yeah, and, and like we talked about too, I mean, even if Kyle Busch is having his problems or Denny Hamlin or Eric Jones, there's always one of them up in front. Oh, there really is. Even though Chase Elliott, we'll get into it, won the Roval. Yeah. I mean, they were all still up there. Yeah, Truex battling for the lead. Yep. Yeah, it, it's quite impressive to watch, and I think that's going to continue right into Homestead. And the second annual running of the Charlotte Roval certainly did not disappoint Blake. No, it did not. Lots of anticipation building for this race, and it began with a bang. William Byron won the pole and was able to hold the advantage early, but trouble for his teammate Alex Bowman. The wreck forced Truex to miss the chicane and serve a penalty. Not long after, a big wreck into the Tums heartburn turn involving three playoff drivers and Jimmy Johnson. Kyle Larson would go on to win stage one. Logano tried some pitting strategy, but traffic as he was exiting pit road led to hard contact with the wall, which would essentially end his race-winning chances. Bubba Wallace went for a spin thanks to playoff driver Alex Bowman. That brought out a caution. Watch as Bowman gets into Bubba in the backstretch chicane before turning him upon the exit, putting the 43 into the wall. Later on, Chase Elliott grabbed the lead from Brad Kozlowski and would win the second stage easily. Hemrick spun early in the third stage. Watch on this restart as Chase full sends it into the heartburn turn. More on that later. Kyle Busch had troubles with a tire going down and ultimately ending his day. Brad's tires didn't seem to be cooperating very well there on pit road. A Stenhouse spin brought about a series of cautions. Harvick was the advantage on this restart, a wild restart at that. And it didn't take long for them to wreck again, this one involving two playoff drivers. Not long after, another wreck with Busher and Kurt Busch. Chase Elliott was the big story of the day, passing Harvick with five laps to go. Newman and Almirola battling it out before Newman missed the backstretch chicane. Elliott with a heck of a comeback. He would go on to win the Roval in dominating fashion for his sixth career victory. Watch him burn out here where he had wrecked earlier in the race right in the heartburn turn. What an awesome celebration for the nine team. Meanwhile, Bubba had something to say to Bowman after the race, splashing some water in his face as Bowman was being attended to by medical staff. Yeah, Nick, seems to me like this was a classic playoff race at the Roval, capped off by an incredible win from Chase. What a comeback. You could talk about the win by Chase, but Alex Bowman there at the end yeah. really came back and yeah. he, what, started sixth in the last restart and worked his way all the way up to second with, I wouldn't even say he had the second fastest race car because no. you had Kozlowski, Truex up there that all were had much faster race cars than him. Yeah, well, and you look at the condition he was in after the after the race on pit road, Bubba certainly didn't help out his cause. Anymore. Yeah, Bubba probably does not feel too good about himself after no. uh, splashing water, after he's getting medical You know, attention. but even then, Bubba's not even in the playoffs, but this race will, will do things to drivers. We saw last year the wreck between Truex and Jimmy on the final turn, oh, when yeah. he would go on to get that win. I mean, there's just always excitement around this race. You never know what to expect going in. Yeah, I'm really glad they brought in because a road course that's yeah. not, I mean, it's kind of a road course. It kind of, that's why they call it the Roval. Yeah. It really brings some excitement to the field and yeah. can always change. You, Chase Elliott is a great road racer. You could kind of expect that coming in. Yeah. But, I mean, it's kind of always turned. Yeah, it, it is. And you saw Eric Jones, that wreck was what put the hole in his radiator. He was in a must-win situation. I mean, there's no way to predict that. You saw the way they went into turn one there. Oh, yeah. You know? It didn't even look like his radiator blew, actually. If yeah. you look at it, like maybe it was his toe arm or something. No, it was his radiator. Completely surprised everyone by him going to the garage. Yeah, there. yeah. It just so much unpredictability around this race. And, and there's more to come here in round 12. Oh, there really is. So now, as we look at the playoff grid now, with Kurt Busch, Eric Amarola, Ryan Newman, and Eric Jones now eliminated, there's some tough competition ahead here in the round of 12. Yeah. 
This is going to be an interesting round. It really is. You have some really great drivers. Yeah. So they have all been performing well. Like right? none of them have been performing bad. Yeah. Especially Alex Bowman with that just yeah. comeback because what he was twenty points down. Yep. With everyone thought, oh no, he was out. Yeah. And then he is now. I would say he has one of the biggest momentums besides Chase Elliott yeah. into the next round. Well, speaking of which, it seems like Hendrick, at least two of those cars, have a lot of momentum going into Dover. You had Chase, who won this race last fall and coming off a win at the Roval. You have uh, Alex Bowman, who finished second here in the spring and just came off an incredible performance at the Roval. It's hard to bet against Hendrick here. And even William Byron seems to be picking it up. Lately. Yeah, it is really is hard to bet, bet against Hendrick, but Joe Gibbs. Yeah, exactly. You, you always have to mention Joe Gibbs. Yeah. Danny Hamlin, always a good racer. Kyle Busch probably will start to pick it up now. Yep. And then Martin Truex. He's, he's going to have to. Well, he really, well, he's still in first. That's in true. That's true. For Build up a lot of points. Leaving the field early on at the Roval. Yeah, and you had Truex, who won this race in the spring. He's always dominant at Dover, it seems. Yeah, he is always dominant. After that, the real wild card comes in, and that's Talladega. Talladega, you could honestly, anyone can win it. Yeah. It's when the big one happens, because we all know it's going to happen, yep. who's involved. Yep. Because it could be anyone from the top four, like, Kyle Busch, Martin mm -hmm. Truex, Denny Hamlin, Brad Keselowski, they could all be involved and you could just have someone like Bowman that's, or yeah. Bo even Clint Boyer down yeah. at the bottom, just win a race right there at Talladega and be set to go to the next Just round. like that, everything changes. And, yes. and this, it shows how important each race is because let's say a driver gets into trouble at Dover. Someone like Kyle Busch, he's been having troubles lately. And then you wreck at Talladega and you have drivers near the bottom of that grid who are able to work their way up and have a few good points races. Even drivers like Kyle Busch could be in some trouble come Kansas. Yeah, I could totally see that coming. Anyone is in trouble. Yeah. Anyone has the possibility of trouble. I guess that always is for the playoffs, but you have Dega is one of the biggest like question marks of yes. what will happen. Dover is the starting point for that, and it'll, it will just continue to Dega and then to Kansas. Yeah, and just the competition level here is so fierce. And speaking of competition, we have Fantasy NASCAR going on, yes. really ramping up here in the playoffs. Uh, so, as this, the format goes right now, you can pick two playoff drivers and two non-playoff drivers. Who's your playoff driver pick for Dover? My playoff driver pick for Dover is because he won in the spring, he was very dominant, is Truex. It's Joe Gibbs, obviously, but yeah. Truex has just been, he started off the season slow, but he's really picked it up towards the end of the season, and then he's just been dominant in the playoffs ever since, so. Yeah, I, I think I'd have to go with Chase Elliott just because of his momentum off the Roval, one of the more impressive dominant um, comeback performances we've seen in some time. Won this race in the fall. He knows how to come in clutch. Actually, it's funny. He has won a race in all three of these tracks we're coming into in the round of 12. Oh, yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how he can carry that momentum. Um, but, you know, all it takes is one issue. But I think I think Truex and Elliott are both going to be uh, contenders come yeah. Sunday. So well, non-playoff driver, who are you going to pick? I like Jimmy Johnson. And I know it sounds like a broken record. Every time NASCAR heads to Dover, they say this is the site of his last win in 2017, two and a half years ago, which is hard to believe. Uh, you know, he typically runs strong here. Everyone's saying this is going to be his, his, his race, but with all the momentum Hendrick has, I could see Jimmy having a very strong run among the non-playoff I mean, and Jimmy hasn't been running bad either. He's gotten That's caught true. up in a couple of wrecks, but even in the playoffs, he's been running top 10. Even, I think, a couple of weeks ago at uh, Vegas, he was yeah. up there too. Yeah. So he's not been running too bad, but he just hasn't been able to get to the pot spot where he wins. So yeah. maybe with Chase Elliott winning, Alex Bowman coming second, he can move up there. I think the the week he wins is going to be one of the biggest weekends in NASCAR in quite some time. Oh, it will be because everyone wants Jimmy to win. Yeah. I want Jimmy to win because it's been a while. So Hard yeah. to see him as an underdog, but that's kind of what he's become. He really has been. So who's your non-playoff driver? Well, I have to go with my man, Matt Benedetto. Hey, you know, early in the, earlier in the season, I would have laughed at you if we were going to Dover in the spring <laughs> and you would have said that. Yeah. Now, I mean, every single race, he's, he's found a way to muscle his way up into the top 15. Oh, he really has. It hasn't had a bad race yet in the playoffs, and even a few races prior. I mean, yeah. Bristol was kind of getting near the end of the season, but he hasn't been racing bad at all. His team has really been performing in the pits, and I see, I mean, he's not going to win per se, but yeah. like a top non-playoff driver, I think is going to be DeBenedetto because his car has just been running very well recently. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have several other uh, options there. You know, Eric Jones, now that he's out of the playoffs, that opens him up, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. Quite an interesting round we're going to be seeing. Oh, it's going to be a very interesting round. Yeah, so looking ahead to this next round, Dover is this Sunday, 1.30 p.m. on NBCSN. Talladega is the following Sunday, October 13th at 1 o'clock on NBC. And Kansas concludes the round of 12 on Sunday, October 20th. That race is at 1.30 p.m. on NBC. Lots of action ahead. And we'll be back to recap any action you missed with the latest headlines. 
Thank you for watching. I'm Nick Rakowski. And I'm Blake Harms. Thank you to Indiana Furniture for providing the table. And we'll see you next time on NASCAR News Now.